I'll be the first to tell you that glazing is definitely not my strong suit. And the reason being is that you have to pick so many colors. You have to, you gotta have to pre-plan out your palette. I really like to go off the cuff and figure out what I'm gonna do on my own. Hey class, Mr. G here. Today we're gonna be talking about glazing and the different types of glazes and what you guys need to know. For many of our glaze pieces that we do, uh, specifically in traditional school setting, we're gonna be using low fire glazes because most of us only have access to an electric kiln. Now, if you're so lucky as to have a gas kiln, that's a lot of fun, or even better, a Raku kiln. Most traditional schools don't have these, the reason being is because it's an open flame, and there's a lot of liability, safety concerns that most people don't wanna bother with. And it's not because the art teacher doesn't know what they're doing, it's just that the principals are a little scared of if you know little Johnny or little Susie's gonna get incinerated and they have to figure out whose body's who. That's the key. Now the pieces that I'll be going over today, these are all low fire pieces. So these are all glaze applications that you can do yourself. The differences that we do need to know in the glaze is, are you gonna be doing a low fire glaze or a high fire glaze? All right, so let's look at some different glaze options. Now, as I said before at the beginning, we're basically gonna be dealing with two types of glaze that you're gonna work with. You're gonna be either working with low fire or high fire. Now, both of these look exactly the same. You really have to read the labels and understand what these things mean. Now, if you're in the low fire range, okay, so the main difference between low fire and high fire is temperature range. Now, low fire is really the spectrum for them is the 04 down to about 08-ish. Uh, all that kind of variants are in the lower end of the spectrum. Now, uh, glass fusing and d doing transfer images, that kind of stuff, you're going to be firing those on much lower scale. So the 020s, the o, um, 018 to 022, those, that's the bottom end of the spectrum. It starts in that under 2000 degrees and then over 2000 degrees. It's really your breakdown between high and low. So I'm in the middle of this edit and I'm working on the glazing thing and I'm realizing this has gotta be at least two parts. It's just way too long. So I'm breaking this thing in half. Yeah, so anyways, there's just so much information. I've gotta break this up into two segments. So this is the first half, next week will be the second half. So if it seems weird, that's why. Now, if it's over that 1945 and you're dealing with that low fire glaze and you accidentally set your kiln to 2000 degrees, that 60 degree change will affect what does happen with the clay and what does happen with the kiln structure. When you're dealing with low fire clay and low fire glazes, you are gonna be dealing with a melt factor at a certain temperature. Now, once you get closer to that 2000 range, if you accidentally over fire it some, you are gonna be changing the chemical composition in the glaze and in the clay itself. These are stability properties. So the stability of the clay is going to be altered and it's gonna to start to melt. The melt point on that clay actually determines that firing principle. As it gets overheated, the bond, the bonds inside of the chemical structure of the clay actually start to break down. And that starts to create a liquefied element. As it liquefies, it's gonna slump, slag, and move. Same thing with the glaze. And we're gonna be getting more into this as we get into the chemical structure of the glazes themselves. But just before we start doing that, I wanna kind of preface to you, these glazes need to stay in the firing ranges that they're listed at. And you do need to be aware of that up front. So when you get a load of glaze, or you're going through a catalog and you're looking around and you're trying to figure out what does this fire to, on the direction it'll say so on this one it's um, glaze fire to cone 05 at medium speed and the reason and medium speed is how the temperature ramps up inside the kiln we can do that in another video but cone 05 is the recommended firing temperature for this glaze these are important things to know because on the high fire on these high fire glazes fire to cone four and six these glazes 04 to 06 these glazes cone four to six now the difference of those are gotta get my kiln chart i can look that up on here too cone four you're going to 21, 24 to cone six, 22, 32. Big temperature difference from the 1945 to the cone six, 22, 32. 300 degrees difference in those two temperature changes. Now, why is that important? The chemical, again, like I said before, it's the chemical structures of the, the glaze itself and the clay that they're being placed onto. Those things are gonna be changing in the side of the firing process. Now, during the firing process, as it heats up, vitrification to the, to the clay pieces, these things are changing, these things are moving. 
So make sure that you have separate forms of glazes itself. All right, I have a lot of different types of glazes here. I use a lot of different types of glazes myself and I want my students to be aware of them just the same. Traditional, typical types of glazes that you have, you're gonna have liquid glazes that we're gonna buy. Uh, most typical is that Amico brand. Not sponsored, these are just what I have in the classroom. I've got a, kind of an assortment of, of everybody, I think. I do have some, uh, some Crystal X, it's in another spot. Uh, mainly what I've got here is the most common stuff that you're going to see in a classroom, which is Mako and Amico brand. All right, when you buy liquid glazes, they're pre-mixed, they're already kind of got some water in them. But if you have some old ones in your room, such as, you know, these ones where the dried out cake is inside of it, I keep gallons of water on my desk and on my tables for my kids and they can pour a little bit in. What makes this stuff go bad is it dries out. Now, does that mean that it is completely useless and you need to throw it in the trash? No, you can use it again. Here's the key thing. When you are buying glaze, a liquid glaze, has already been mixed properly together. That means all of the chemicals have been already mixed together and, cre and create full viscosity inside of the container. Now, as the clay dries out, or as the glaze dries out, you're gonna have sediment seep to the bottom, water goes to the top, and it's gonna just dry out over time. As that happens, we just add water to it. All the chemicals are still in the glaze container. You just need to hydrate everything up, turn it back into a slush, mix it up, and the glaze works just fine. Now, if you were buying dry glaze, now, if you remember these, these are from the 70s. I love these things. My college professor had a, had a ton of these, and we had to mix our own. We had to know what goes into mixing glazes. If you buy the powdered version of glaze, this glaze stuff does have some issues with it. One, you cannot mix small batches of this glaze out. You have to mix the full container of this glaze for it to fire properly. Why does that matter? Just a few seconds ago, as I said, when you buy these glazes, these are already pre-mixed liquid in them and they just have to be shooken up really well because the su suspension of all the chemicals inside of it needs to be reconstituted to each other. And these bins, the manufacturer, when they make them, they make them in a giant auger and they just mix around all the powder and then they sift the powder into these. Now, for the most part, these should work fine. Just make sure that you dump the whole thing in, mix them up properly, evenly distribute all the chemicals inside of it. Does that guarantee that this works 100% of the time? No, because I have opened some bags where the colorant portion is based at the top and they put the clay body in the bottom, coloring at the top, and then you have to hand mix it yourself. These things happen over time. Just be aware that that's how that works. When you're dealing with these, make sure that you're mixing up a full batch at one time to make sure that all your chemicals are mixed together properly. This will ensure that the glaze properly adheres to the piece as well as all of the firing processes when it comes out of the kiln. There's no crazing, cracking, or uh, like fissures on the kiln, on the glaze itself. And these things happen from where bits of the glaze, the chemical composition, some they're not bound together. So if some of the clay body was not sized right to the clay piece itself, you're going to have those tears in the glazing where it looks like these missing patches. It's it's a recess. It's where it's recessed from itself because it didn't have the properties to fully attach. These things happen. Finally, the last two things that, you, that we have to go over are under glazes. All mine come in these little bitty baby containers, which uh, is really easy for me and my students to understand. These are the under glazes. These are the regular glazes. Mr. G is gonna make these ones. Now, under glazes themselves, as a rule of thumb, these can be applied to greenware as well as bisque fired pieces. Now, for the greenware pieces, you're gonna make sure that you apply this. Once it gets to leather hard state, don't apply it to fresh raw clay because all that raw clay is just gonna blend with the chemicals and you're not gonna see most of the color that you're probably gonna put on there. And finally, the last thing that we have on the glazing table today is some raw chemicals. Now I buy raw chemicals to mix in some glazes to A, change the color or B, change the properties of the glaze. Some Something like this, this raw umber, I'll be using as a slip variant. This will be a dark brown slip that we'll be using as an on-go exterior decoration. Works just the same as our under glazes, except this really needs to go on high fire stuff because the raw umber doesn't burn off until it reaches, that, until it reaches a higher level of charity. So this kind of stays raw on the bisque square pieces so even if you put on under if you put this on raw clay it'll fire and it'll attach sort of it'll still have a dust particle on the outside of it because it's not fully adhered to the pieces because of the raw colorant one it doesn't have a clay body to mix with two uh it doesn't have full maturity chemical itself until it reaches a certain temperature and that temperature usually is about 2100 degrees now the one thing that i don't have up here that kind of falls in the same category as the raw chemicals is mason stains. A mason stain is a ground pigment colorant such as the uh, raw umber that you 
push that you wedge into the clay itself and that's going to stain the clay a specific color it's similar to an underglaze is that you're gonna you can apply it to raw clay but it's different from an underglaze because this is just an exterior application only mason stains are fused into the clay body to create a colored clay as a uh, as a penetrating substance this stuff is just for topical use all right, so let's talk about a little bit about the specifics of these clay, these glazes and whatnot. So start off with underglaze. So the underglaze here is going to be applied to the exterior of the piece. It can be applied to greenware, it can be applied to bisqueware, uh, but at the end of the day, it's just a simple paint-on substance. Now, with the underglaze, it is going to be a matte substance 24/7. This stuff never gets a glossy finish on it. When you're applying matte, when you're applying underglaze, I recommend that you apply more during bisqueware because most people like to carve through it with the Mishima or Scraffito technique. Be doing that on another video, but also you can uh, apply this into green into bisqueware. Now, if you're applying it to bisqueware, you can easily add a color over the top of it. Same thing if you were doing it with the greenware, you can apply glaze on top of it after the fact, after it's been fired through that bisque firing. What you're going to get out of that benefit is if you have a dark colored underglaze and you have a lighter if you have a lighter colored glaze that you're going to put on top of it, you're going to see those colors show through very easily, kind of like this. I had a dark, I think this is probably the raw umber that I painted on the outside of this cup. And then I added a wash on top of this of just some, some basic glaze. I think this was our mystery glaze. Add on to the top of it so that you have those different levels of glazes on the pieces. Now, it depends on your application. What do you want to do with it? Do you want to get a lot of color? Use an underglaze. Uh, you want to make sure that the color is, is true to the color inside the bottle? Use an underglaze. If you're going for a gloss finish, you have a couple options. You can either A, use a gloss colored glaze or ugh, the big giant jug of clear stuff. Usually it's pink. That goes on top of the glazes just to finish it off to give it that glossy finish afterwards. Now, if gloss or matte is, is uh, now if you're debating on whether doing a gloss finish or a matte finish, that really is up to you. Uh, aesthetically, uh, the gloss finish is gonna, you know, be a lot more tactically, uh, pleasant on the on the hand because you're that's just how raw clay sounds on a bare hand it's not pleasant it's it's a very it's like touching a brick I mean that's how it is uh, if that's the finish that you like and that's the finish that you're going for fine that's good cool if you want the smooth finish that nice smooth lacquer glass finish that has to be gloss make sure that you're reading the labels that's a gloss finish now is it always the case no rule of thumb that I go by with my students is if it's an underglaze it's definitely gonna be matte if it is um, a low fire glaze that has that it's food safe, usually that's gonna have a gloss finish in the end of it. So just a quick recap. So for your gloss glazes, you have gloss glazes, nice shiny finish. It, it's got that glassine uh, look to it. We're gonna be talking about fritz and how fritz affect the way that gloss glazes come out. We're gonna talk about that next video. So in using underglaze, you're gonna have a flat finish on your piece so if you want to make it shiny put some gloss on on top of it use that clear gloss to show you the big pink bottle before and that'll give you that that nice shiny finish whereas like a, on the joker here you have the red mouth i use a gloss glaze for it but the white skin use an underglaze for that so i hope some of the i hope this helped out make glaze a little less complex for you guys okay guys so like i said we're going to be breaking this up into two sections because there's so much information that we're covering in this video got to break it up into two for you guys again doing more stuff in the next video so stay tuned for that as always let's go ahead and finish up for our, with our homework Homework is don't forget to like, subscribe, share on all the various platforms. Make sure that we get the message out there. Again, if you have questions, comments, or concerns, raise your hand down in the comments below. Happy to answer the questions from my classmates. Other than that, as always, I will see you guys next class. Until then, later, guys.